All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started here. So if you haven't already intuited this, we're talking today about making the leap, doing successful products as a web agency. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about a few things specifically. And uh, just sort of forewarning, if this is not what you were hoping to have be covered, then uh, I will not be offended if you leave. Uh, so we're going to be talking about things like your motivators and your goals and building products what an MVP is in the role of marketing and things like that, we are not going to be talking about how to build a product, what kind of technical frameworks, what sort of design considerations, A-B testing, any of those sort of very specific techniques on how to build a product. Um, so this is a lot more about how to think about a product, how to plan for a product, and how to uh, be able to deliver one successfully from a business perspective. Um, so I think, uh, furthermore, like the people who are going to get the most out of this talk are... are this describes us. So I'm curious, actually, just a show of hands, how many of us make things for clients? Yay! Okay, excellent. And uh, have an idea or a prototype? Good, cool. All right, congrats. And then <laughs> wondering what to do now. Really? Oh, all right. All right. Um, good. Okay, so this, this, I think, well, we'll see. We've got the right audience in the room. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Drew Gordon, and... Uh, I have uh, an interesting perspective in this. So I ran a web services firm called Gorton Studios for about 15 years. Um, and we did full service design, development, training, content strategy, et cetera, et cetera, for an array of clients. So it's this small team of you know, programmers and UX people and such coming into a, a client and saying, what do you need, and helping plan that and build that and, and deliver it. Um, as that agency, we also built something called Node Squirrel. And Node Squirrel is a backup service that plugs into Drupal, so it makes it easy to have offsite backups. So we, we were an agency that did that. And then since then, in 2015, actually just before DrupalCon Los Angeles, Pantheon bought Node Squirrel. Um, and, and the twist in that plot for me was when they said, Drew, you should go with and join Pantheon. And I was kind of surprised at that. And, but anyways, long story short, I did that. So I've got this breadth of experience. I understand what it's like to build things for clients. And it, it, I was a team of seven, and now I'm up to a team of 80 at a products company. So it's very different worldviews. And I'm hoping that I can synthesize as much of that as possible so that you too can go off and be successful and make your own leap. Um, the conventional wisdom uh, of doing a product as a services company. How many people have heard something like this? Don't do it, uh, right? Oh, come on, more of us have heard that, right? Um, this is definitely, I don't know, I heard this a lot, yet all of us are still doing it. So good, good for us. Um, the, you can do it. It's very doable. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard. Um, and so hopefully, again, what we're talking about today will, will help you be able to you know, have your hands raised and, and give this session next time at your local camp or the next DrupalCon. Um, there are successful examples in our space. And in preparing for this talk, you know, those of us who have been doing this kind of thing, we often have conversations. But we'll be looking at some of these very specific examples and advice from folks who have done this successfully. And so uh, in the case of uh, Pantheon, for example, was founded by some of the founders of both Four Kitchens and Chapter 3, who are web agencies doing the same thing as like Gorton Studios. Lullabot is just a fantastic agency that's been around for a very long time. They made something called Drupalize Me, um, and that's a, based off the sort of like training expertise that they built. Um, so it's a, a, it's a great service, and we actually have Addie. Hi, hi Addie. And we'll see some of her advice here in our session. Uh, Gorton Studios obviously made Node Scroll. I've already talked about that. Kalamuna may, is an agency based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they make something called Calabox, uh, which is a local development environment um, that is more modern than, say, MAMP. Uh, so if you have local development environment sort of needs um, and are wondering how to solve those, uh, you should take a look at Calabox. It's like pop it in, and it's got you know uh, best practices, container-based architecture, optimize, you know, things like varnish and, and uh, a whole tool stack there for doing really good development. Uh, phase two is another agency, uh, about 150 people. They're based in the U.S., but they have people all around the world. And they maintain a number of distributions, including one that's called Open Publish, um, which is for uh, publishers, basically, as a, as a, uh, uh, a starting, it's a distribution, Drupal distribution, 
for intended to be used by publishers and media people. Uh, and then Provonix, and we have Christoph, I think, somewhere in the room as well, uh, another small firm that has gone off and made something called Wacub, which is for documenting websites and having you know guided tours and the ability to sort of click through and have a, a self-documenting interface. Um, so we're going to see you know lessons from all of these folks. Uh, and hopefully, again, synthesizing a lot of the conversations that many of us have had over the years about these things. Um, and and uh, an another resource, so we'll have all of those people helping guide these things. But one of the things I also want to uh, point out is uh, a lot of these ideas are uh, from a kind of startup called Lean Startup. This is sort of like this, the, the, the notion. If you're not familiar with um, uh, the idea of a Lean Startup and you're sitting here, you should be. So I would really recommend this site. Um, leanstack.com in particular has lots of great articles. Um, uh, this book recommendation actually came to me via Ryan Srama, who gave a talk in some ways that's similar to this at DrupalCon Latin America. Um, so again, if this topic interests you, I would encourage you to check out these resources as well. Um, again, I'm going to try and take all of that and present it in a way that I think makes sense for all of us with a sort of shared background of building things for clients. Um, and, and these are the things I want to talk about. So uh, before you start a product, you need to define some things. And all of us who didn't do some of these things um, uh, have wished we had. So uh, specifically, if you don't know what your goals are for the product, it's going to be really hard to figure out if you're doing the right thing and being very explicit about those goals. And likewise, once you've got those goals, from there saying, what is success going to be? What will we call success? If you're, um, and we'll dive into each of these things. How are you going to fund it? How are you going to resource it? What are these methods going to be? MVP, the minimum viable product. What's the smallest version of that thing that you can build? This one, I think, for all of us, I mean, all of these are challenging, but as people who build things for others, um, understanding the MVP and, and actually getting to minimum viable product is very hard. Uh, I think we have a tendency as people who make things, when, when in the vacuum, what we're going to do is make more things. And that's actually not really good for a product. Um, and then uh, another thing that I think is a blank spot for many of us is marketing. Um, uh, we understand maybe you know like maybe that we understand that word, but the the critical importance of marketing in a product is you you just cannot underestimate how uh, important that is for your long term success. Um, so let's dive into goals. So I think there's a number of um, motivators for why we attempt products, and uh, if you understand your motivators. It will help you know how to make decisions. So this is pretty basic, but I think it's the right place to start. Know your goals. And I think there's really six goals, as I, you know, I've talked with others, uh, that, that influence us. So fun, obviously. Fun is, you know, like if you're just doing this as yourself, you just, you know, nights and weekends, you're having fun doing it, that's great. Um, organizationally, you might call fun something like, we have been working on this long project, and it's been a bit of a slog, and the team is not very motivated. We're going to give them something enjoyable to do. The product can help fill that space. Um, learning is, again, its own reward. We are in technology. We like to learn. We probably, you know, by virtue, we probably self-selected this industry because we enjoy learning. But also, if we don't continue learning new things, we quickly go stale, uh, and that is a very big problem for our professional careers. Sometimes products are a response to an internal need. Um, so we wanted to build this thing because we were really tired of all the time and effort we are spending recreating it every time. Um, that's an example. Actually, Calibox started like that, and essentially Pantheon did as well. Uh, it was, came out of a number of projects that were you know, big, early Drupal uh, uh, major sites. Uh, lead generation is all about putting something out into the world and saying, it's by us. And then people seeing it and saying, like, oh, I like this thing. Uh, I'm going to contact those people because I want something similar. Um, so getting out there, it's a, it's a sales tool. Um, and closely related that, to that is something, you know, thought leadership. So thought leadership being demonstrating that you are the people who deeply understand Drupal and something else, for example, or whatever it is, the, whatever your idea or prototype it is, um, 
under, you are, you are, you're putting your stamp on that and saying, we're the people who understand Drupal Magento integration or something like that. Um, that's thought leadership. If anybody wants to have like the best Drupal Magento integration, they're going to find you. Um, and, and the last one is profit. Not all products will seek profit, but those that do have some important considerations. Um, they all have downsides, however. So we kind of talked about the nice things. Um, the cons here, like fun, if you're only, so essentially, uh, if you are only doing a product for one or two of these reasons, I would say that you are in danger, right? If you can have a product that, you know, ticks like four of these, that's fantastic. Five and six, I don't even, that would be mind blowing. If you could get all six of these into your idea, you should definitely do it. Um, so I would say that, you know, the more of these that you have, the better. Because it turns out, if you're doing it just for fun, as soon as it's not fun, you're going to be done. Um, and it will be not fun. There will definitely be not fun in creating a product. Um, downside of learning is focus. The world is a big place. There are so many technologies, so many things that you can learn. Um, just wandering out and learning things, uh, you know, you can lose focus with that. Uh, and it's not the most efficient way to learn, frankly, uh, building a product. But there, there can be something there. Uh, internal need. Uh, solving that problem that you, you just really want this great solution, you understand it really well. Um, again, a product with like a logo and branding and something that other people can use is a lot more overhead than just simply building it. Uh, something, building, I think we probably all know this, building something for yourself is a lot easier than building it for someone else. Um, Lead generation. The, the problem with lead generation is that the clients that you tend to get with a free or very low cost version are people who want free or low, very, very low cost things. And so to go out and, uh, you know, offer something, uh, that is free and that, you know, will get widely distributed, most of the people who are really interested in it are going to want the free thing. And they might contact you and think, like, I want one of these, uh, but the amount of uh, people who can afford your services uh, will be a very small percentage of that uh, of that group. Um, the problem with thought leadership, or the thing that you'll have to solve for with thought leadership, the con, is the burden of maintenance. So if you go out and say that you are the best, you're the experts in Drupal Magento integration, to use that example again, um, if that starts not being a very good, like you don't maintain the modules or the distributions or things like that, all of a sudden it's the opposite, right? Um, you can charge higher rates perhaps because you have this thought leadership position, but if you don't stay on top of it, you don't release the Drupal 8 version, you don't fix the bugs, you don't, etc. all of a sudden you're negative. It's a double-edged sword. It's a negative. It's a, it's a weight on your, on your firm. And for those of us who are interested in making money with these things, I guarantee you you will make less money than if you were to do a service, right? All of us in this room are here as services companies, and we're successful enough to go to Barcelona, Spain, and come to a conference and spend time that we're not billing. Uh, we know how to do services really well. Um, if your hourly rate is, uh, say, a thousand, say, let's you charge $100 an hour, and so if you were to spend 1,000 hours working for a client, you would get $100,000, just round numbers. Uh, if you spent that instead on a product, you spent that 1,000 hours on the product, you would have $0. $0, $100,000, you will get more money making a service. Or, sorry, charging your clients for a service. The, the, the hopeful thing is that you can charge for it enough and enough and enough and enough and enough way off in the future that you could get a million but it is a long time between now and then. And it, you really need to understand that. There is no get-rich-quick scheme. Um, you're already in it. We have, you know, all of us know how to do services. We're, again, so now I would say, so in the node squirrel example, we, would, we actually did a good job of this. We sat down and said, like, what are the things that we really care about? Um, fun, learning, and profit. That was what we were after. You know, there's a little bit of internal need there, but... Um, again, it was sort of overkill. So this is how we uh, prioritize the world. But different you know, projects have different sort of rankings here. So Open Publish, which is a, a distribution, uh, again, for the publishers, it's about lead generation and thought leadership. It allows phase two to stand out in the market and have a lot of those kinds of clients contact them. And then when they do, 
to uh, be able to charge a premium because they say, we understand this space so well. Um, so be clear about why you're doing something. And once you've got the whys, you need to also take some time to define success. Again, many of us who didn't do a really good job of this um, uh, wish that we had. Um, so if you don't know where you're going, it's a good chance you're not going to arrive. You're going to spend time wandering around, making weird decisions, uh, and uh, eventually either maybe you'll make it. So, I, mean, I think there are many, many, many more examples. For all of the, the positive examples that we have there, there are a lot of non-examples uh, of people who started down the path, had an idea, made it a little ways, and then, you know, they didn't have the goals, they didn't have the motivation, didn't know where they're going, whatever reason they make it through. I think one of the things that is easy to get lost on is if you don't have your success criteria mapped out, we're going to have, you know, this many users by this amount of time. Or we're going to have, uh, you know, we want, if it's lead generation, we, we want a thousand leads in the next year. Or whatever it is, come up with something. You can change your mind later. That's okay. But know at least what you're judging yourself against. Because you're going to have hard decisions. Uh, there will be times where you think, is this worth it? All right, this is great. I've learned some things. We've tried some things. Do we keep doing it? Uh, and that's a constant question. And if you can't come back to this sort of like, what are our goals? How are we doing? Uh, then you, it's a hard question to answer. Um, so if, uh, you know, the question, things like, should we I'll actually, I'm just going to do everyone a favor. Should we add a new feature? Could be a question you might ask yourself. The answer is no. Do not add a new feature. Don't do that. If you're in this room, uh, you should, you know, like, we're all still figuring this out. The answer is no. No new features. Um, sponsor Drupalcon, that'd be great. But, you know, figuring out all kinds of things. Um, your definition of success is going to be critical. Um, and, uh, and here, actually, in the, in the words of, uh, of, of Addy, who's in the room, so, this was, you know, I won't, I won't read that out loud. That's, I'll let it, you can all read faster than I would say it out loud. Um, there's a danger in not having this figured out. Um, not only for the product, but for your agency. So that having a limping, half-baked product inside your company can really mess with people. Um, so not only can it be, a, you know, sort of like a distraction of time and money, um, it can also, like, why are we doing this, cause sort of fundamental problems and such. So, uh, again, know where you're going. You're going to have a much better chance of getting there. How you get there, um, there's really only a few choices. And, again, each of these are going to have uh, downsides, you know, upsides and downsides. Nights and weekends, right? We all have those. We have times when we're not working. Being able to just work on a product during that time is always an option. Uh, free time inside of your firm is another thing. Like, we have free time, right, where we aren't always working every single second for a client. So the uh, ability to use some of that time to work on a product is great. That works. Or you can spend money. You can buy either your own internal time, hire someone internally, maybe to be devoted to it, or hire someone externally as a contractor. You, you, these, these are the options. Um, and the downsides, though, uh, is that while you have, you know, time and you have money, you don't have enough um, because whatever it is, you are going to be super tempted to, you know, it's, you don't have enough <laughs> uh, all by itself. And while nights and weekends line up for sort of like the fun and learning kinds of things, if your goals include business objectives like thought leadership and uh, sales leads and things like that, uh, doing it in nights and weekends is going to lose its charm very quickly. Um, so, Node Squirrel, uh, the way we did it, we, we did our free time. And the downside of that is it took us forever. Um, it, was, it was not good. We spent a little bit of money, but mostly it was free time. Um, and it was a struggle. It was a really big struggle. Um, so, oh, did someone have a question that they started there? Oh, all right. Um, so, uh, Alec, who's not here, but again, Calibox, this, uh, the, the tool for uh, local development. Um, 
If, you, if it's not directly symbiotic, start treating it as a separate business immediately, even if you haven't formed a new entity around it. Um, make sure you understand how you're going to get there and take it seriously. So once you kind of know like these sort of intellectual questions, what are my goals and what's my success criteria, um, you need to focus on the minimum viable product. Um, and if the, the term MVP is not one you're familiar with, go Google that, do a lot of reading. Um, again, some of the lean stacks, other resources and such. But a minimum viable product, I really like this definition, is the smallest thing that you can build that delivers customer value. And, you know, bonus, if you can capture some of that back, even better. Uh, and that's meaning, can you charge for it? Um, and uh, this one, I think, is really, really hard. I already mentioned this. For all of us who build things for a living, we know how to build things. We maybe have you know, interface sort of, uh, like we think we, we have, um, have well-formed opinions about all kinds of things and building things. Uh, the minimum viable product, I guarantee you, is smaller than you think it is. Um, the minimum viable product that we built for Node Squirrel was a lot bigger than it needed to be. Um, it was, a, it was a mediumly viable product in probably every sense of the word. <laughs> um, so, uh, and again, everyone, everyone who's ever attempted this uh, has, has, has this wisdom to share. Make it smaller, right? And I hope to challenge you, actually, with, a, with an idea of what even smaller could be. But Christoph, who's actually sitting in the back over there, um, said it really quite well. You're your own worst enemy. I think this really applies to those of us, again, who are sitting, you know, in the context of DrupalCon where we build things for people. Um, we are our own worst enemies. Uh, featureitis is not good. Um, adding a new feature to try and make the product better is almost always, or to, to try and make the product more viable is almost always the wrong choice. It might need more marketing. It might need a lot of things, but it probably doesn't need a new feature. So getting to the MVP involves um, a number of things. You need to know what the problem is that you're solving. You should have an identity. Like, it's, gonna have, it's a product. It needs a name. Uh, if you're fancy, you can give it a logo, uh, and a color scheme, and a brand identity, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but even that can be thinner. You need to understand your audience and uh, have an idea of how you're going to reach that audience. That one, again, for us, and I think for many people, again, is, is, a, is a tricky one. And then finally, you're going to need to figure out what the pricing is going to be. Uh, if you don't figure it, you're going to have a lot of questions about it. If you, you know, it's free or not. Is there a free version? If there's not free versions, uh, et cetera. Um, so again, for Node Squirrel, the problem was offsite backup. And uh, we came up, we had a name, we came up with a name, Node Squirrel, and we had a brand and a logo. And it still exists, actually. Uh, and our, audi our, <clears throat> our audience was anyone using a, a Drupal site. Uh, our path to market, we were super fortunate. Um, back of a migrate is a module that's widely used already, and that's a module that we maintain. And, and we came up, it's going to be $5. We had to just sort of pick numbers. It's now free, actually, as sort of like a sidebar. Uh, once Pantheon bought Node Squirrel, uh, it made Node Squirrel the base tier free. So if you don't have a reliable offsite backup for your various sites, I, you know, just go create a free account. It's free forever, um, and you can back up your sites. Um, so uh, we produced, as part of that, so getting to Node Squirrel, uh, we produced a website and all of, you know, a whole lot of work to get to this. Um, I would say doing a different, um, if, if our motivators had been purely profit, um, there's actually something that was, like, the first time I heard about it, uh, I, I was actually really taken back by it. Um, the idea that actually what your MVP is looks maybe more like this. And this is antithetical, perhaps, to, again, the way many of us approach a problem. Um, the idea that if you're building Node Squirrel, the right place to start is not engineering it and building it in the back of a migrant and doing all those things. What you need is a landing page that says, Node Squirrel, backup, yay, and it has a button on it that says try now or buy now or whatever it is. You build a page, sort of talking about what, what this thing is. Um, you, have a, you have a form it goes to on the other side. You get people to it via Google AdWords or something like that. 
And then you have some metrics, something that's tracking how many times somebody clicked on this and clicked on that. They click on sign up now at $5 a month or whatever it is. They get to the page that says, thank you. Uh, we're so glad you're interested in our product. It'll be out soon. And a nice email, and you have their email address. We'll send you an email as soon as it's ready to go. And that's all. And when I first heard about that, I thought that that was just like, I, I didn't like it. Uh, it was, you know, it feels a little bit you know, like you're promising something. I, I had problems with it. But in the years since, you know, sort of made Node Squirrel, in, in, like I heard that maybe a year or two into the product, uh, project, uh, I wish I'd heard it sooner um, because it is such a, it would have been such a shortcut to a lot of learning um, that, uh, you know, hopefully it's something, you know, the, the minimum viable product could be a lot smaller and it might not actually involve a lot of the amazing talents that we in this room have. There's not a lot of programming here. There's some design, There's but, like, this is a shockingly small thing and, um, really, anyone can do it. And, and so I think for all of us, having the discipline to try to be as small as possible is really the thing that we all have to focus on. Uh, and that brings us to the next problem. Um, you need customers more than features. And this is really, really true. And we're gonna, I want to just um, try, try to demonstrate this. We're going to see you know, live demo time. So... How many of you, all right, so manage Drupal websites. Actually, we already heard that, but how many people manage Drupal websites? Great, all right, most everybody. How many, before now, before I started yammering and before reading the sessions of Drupal, how many of you had heard of Node Squirrel? Okay, cool, wow, oh, this is gonna go well. All right, how many of you knew what it was, at least vaguely? Like, I knew it was, in, you know, like if you knew the word backup, all right. How many of you thought it was a good idea? For, and I should be, I'm sorry, I should be like listing this out. So at manage Drupal websites, most everybody in the room. Heard of Node Squirrel, it was actually pretty good. Like I would say 80% of the room knew what it was, 60% of the room. How many thought it was a great idea? Maybe said something nice about it. So we're down to 20% of the room, something like that. How many of you tried it? You're dropping quickly, right? Good. How many of you bought it? Two. 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 Uh, that's, actually, that's statistically, that's what I was hoping for, actually. I thought two to three. Uh, that's about right. Um, and here we are in the, you know, the place in the world right now with the deepest fullest concentration of our audience. Um, and we had some, you know, like, we had a, a lot of, you know, nice press about us and such. Uh, the world's a big place. There's a lot of messages. Uh, and going, the, the difference between specifically thought it was a great idea, which was maybe 20% to bought it, which is about two, is really interesting. If someone tells you, that's a great idea, I really want to use it, they might not actually want to use it. They might just be polite. Um, or they'll think they, you know, they might actually think that they would, but when it comes to it, like, oh, other things to do today, not going to happen. Um, and this is, this is where marketing is. Um, so, again, many of us in small firms uh, don't have a dedicated marketing person and maybe just don't have, a, like, a deep understanding for what it means to do marketing. Um, so, uh, you know, at, at the uh, business session yesterday, we had a conversation, uh, and I recognize one of the people at my table exactly. We were talking about this. Uh, so it was all the, you know, so like the business summit yesterday, and so a lot of people, you know, running businesses and such. Uh, we were talking about how big a team before you actually need a full time marketing person. And we, the consensus we came to is about 25 to 30 people. And then, you know, that's the point at which full time marketing is, makes sense. And that's somebody that's just focusing on getting out messages and like making sure you're visible. Um, and I think that ratio is about right. It's like one thirty. Like you should not start marketing, you know, things at you know thirty people. But at, that's the point at which it's enough for a full time person's brain. Um, with the product, I think that answer is closer to four. Node Squirrel did not actually make it to a four person team before we joined Pantheon. But if we had made it to four and one of them wasn't in marketing, uh, I would have been an idiot. Uh, I might not, who knows, you know. Uh, having gone to Pantheon, um, it's really interesting for me. So Pantheon is a team of about 80 people right now. And there are three major disciplines. There's, well, the three biggest disciplines are engineering, which is about 20, and they're, they're similar in size, it's about 20-ish people. Um, 
support, you know, people helping people use the platform, answer tickets, etc., about 20-ish people, and marketing, about 20-ish people. Like, it's about a quarter of what we do by, by a number of human beings. And the rest, there's, there's folks in sales, there's folks in you know, HR and other things, and there's leadership and such. Um, but it's about a quarter of what we have to do in order to be viable. And that is a hugely, I mean, that's just a, that's a, that's a crazy difference. Um, and you might even want to consider, you know, starting off, your first person might actually, as soon as you've got it built, your first person might want to be doing almost all marketing. Um, so, <clears throat> again, putting it all together, uh, making sure you have uh, your goals set out, be clear about those, understand what you're, you know, what is it that's motivating you? Why are you willing to take this on? Because when the, you know, when the path gets uh, dark and scary and it's not fun anymore, you're going to need to come back and check: is this still worth it? Um, and make sure you've got that success criteria set out. Have those methods decided upon. Make it really small, much smaller than you than you imagine, and uh, and then just focus on marketing. You. Get the word out, and that is the way to make it through and actually have the, the sustainability for people to keep, you know, people using your product will make it more sustainable so you can keep building it. But if you don't have that marketing piece in there, and if that's not already you know, something you're thinking a lot about, um, that's a big blind spot. Um, I did that way faster than I did the, I don't know, I must have like sped up my speaking by a fair amount. That is actually what I wanted to cover today. I knew I would have time for questions and answers. Um, there are a number of us. I'm actually going to call you out again. I see. Uh, how many of you have a product that you have produced that is out in the market that someone could go use today, has a logo, et cetera? Awesome. Holy, that's fantastic. All right, so I hope you look around. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I might ask for um, you know, insights from the room as well. So I'm going to call that done. All right. Um, <laughs> thank you. Great, great talk. Yeah, thank you. Good job. Um, so uh, one, one thing, it's not so much a question. It's more uh, kind of a reframing. Um, one thing that I've been thinking a lot more about re lately is that um, there's something called productized services. And if you want to productize and you want to get, well, Ultimately, if you do it for the money, uh, if you build a product for the money, it's all about getting more leverage on your time. So mm -hmm. like making more money for the same amount of time that you spend. That's the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a shortcut for that. Like mm -hmm. you don't have to go to the bat cave and start building products. Mm -hmm. And uh, as engineers, this is a very, uh, very difficult thing to do. Or like we, we just start building. But... Um, maybe what you really should be doing is defining a process, like figuring out what, what are your ideal customers, like what, what has been working really well, um, and then processify that service uh, and, and figuring out like how, what is going to be your process that you're going to be doing over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and that way increase your margin. Yeah. And then you can, you can charge a, a, a fixed fee, which is much higher than your hourly rate, um, uh, and, and specialize, uh, be more referable, uh, get people to know you for that service, and, and actually make more money that way. Yeah. And that's, this is a, a really hard lesson <laughs> right. that, uh, that, that I think is important to know about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Turns out we know how to do one thing really, really well. Getting better at that is, is an incremental step that, um, that, that's a lot closer to achievable than it is building a whole product. It's a fun journey, uh, you know, like, yay, us for doing it. You know, like, everybody here is doing it. It's, it is fun. It, it's, uh, I'm very happy I sat down on the path, but uh, it's also got hard spots. Uh, yeah, so the, the question is, how do you see open source in the community? Uh, what are the pros and cons? Um, so obviously, so and actually, I think uh, I, I can speak for a number of people who answered similar kinds of questions as I was preparing for this. Um, the wonderful thing about open source is it allows you to iterate and prototype really rapidly on a pretty robust framework. And um, you know, Drupal in particular is a great tool to build with. Um, the the problem is intellectual property. So 
um, someone like if, if you, for example, are phase two and you have open publish and you have this distribution, um, you also have what Dries called, I think, uh, famously, the most expensive lead generation tool ever invented. It took a lot of time and money for them to produce that. Um, and there is zero chance for them. To, I mean, they could charge some money for it, but it's open source. It is, you know, completely open intellectual property. Um, and so they couldn't really, you know, it, it would be highly unlikely that anyone would buy it um, more than, say, five times uh, and without angering enough people. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the places where, where people have um, uh, been successful, I think, is when they have something, there's like a recurring fee for something. So, for example, Drupalize Me or Node Squirrel or Pantheon, for that matter, we all kind of are used to, the world is sort of used to paying for uh, those kinds of services. So hosting, we sort of get that there's servers running somewhere. So anything you can do that sort of ties in or Drupalize Me, you sort of get that you're tying into this like library of learning. Um, anything you can do that sort of ties into something that the mindset is already there for for I'm willing to pay for this, I understand that there's something here, um, is is m way more viable. And that's can be, that can be a tricky, I mean, like the Venn diagram of that and open source is not a huge overlap, but there are definitely places there. Sorry? Open SaaS? Open SaaS? Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Do you have an example in mind, or, or are you uh, thinking of something in particular? Yeah. But, okay, all right. Well, we'll wait. All right, awesome. Well, <laughs> good luck. Yes. Hey, Drew. Great session, man. Um, I suppose most of us sell services, like you said, so we're more used to um, doing marketing uh, through thought leadership, blogging, mm -hmm. coming to conferences, so we're, we're pretty good at that, I think. Um, or we want to be good at that. Uh, in terms of, of a product, do you think there's like a formula that we can use to create marketing without putting money into this? I mean, you talked about mm -hmm. AdWords, so you you know you create your landing page, like you said, you put your call to action, you make people register, they're gonna curse at you because the product's not ready, like yeah. you said. Um, mm -hmm. But then you have to take people to your site. How do you do that? How do you do that for B two B? Um, do you guys have any experience? I mean, you can share from Pantheon on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll I'll, I'll give an answer. I think Christoph's got a, a, like an answer he wants to give too. So I'll I'll uh, so for uh, to do like one of the things you said that jumped out at me was to do it for free. Um, no, I mean I don't think so. If we you know uh, if I had a magic wand that that'd be great. But I I know of no way to do that for free. Um, do. That doesn't involve. <laughs> do you? All right, excellent. I mean that that doesn't correspondingly involve a huge trade-off of time, right? There's, there's no, uh, it's one or the other, and you're paying with something. Um, I don't know, the, I can so, expound, but. So, so what, what we did with WalkUp, so WalkUp is basically an alternative, uh, alternative for WalkMe, which is a really expensive enterprise service. Um, so we built, we made a web, uh, we made a blog post titled, uh, Free and Open Source Alternatives for WalkMe. And we, we did a review of a bunch of other tools, and then there was also WalkUp. Uh, and we are, until today, without doing any effort at all, at all we get weekly two, three signups for WalkMe because of, uh, for WalkUp because of that. Um, so you, you can just do um, marketing jujitsu uh, with your open source tool. This is if you do an open source tool, or if you do a cheaper tool, although that I wouldn't go for a cheaper version of something. Don't do that, it's a bad idea. Uh, but if you if you go the open source route and have another business model around that, then you can you can you can do it that way with very very little effort and very little money, uh, and just get a steady stream of of uh, leads coming. Yeah, in. actually, all right. So that that is ex all right. Thank you. That was a good a, a, a better answer in some ways. Um, the so using um, a really smart analysis of your market and then figuring out what content you can produce is something you definitely should be doing. That is a great stat, though, like one article producing two, three signups a week. That's excellent. Other questions? Yeah, so the question is, would Node Scroll have been a successful product if, uh, if we sort of quit, set everything aside, and just focused on that? Um, um, yeah, it, so one of the things, as I did the timeline, 
So we started working on Node School in 2011. And um, here, you know, in 2015, Pantheon purchased it. And it had grown, like, all of the numbers were nice, but it hadn't, you know, like, it, it was still below a single full time person's uh, salary. Um, so if we had just said, uh, right, we're going to set aside $300,000, we're going to turn off everything else, we're going to focus down on this, what would we done? We would have gotten a lot faster. Um, I don't know if it would have been a success, though, because I, I th the, the long time horizon actually um, probably helped us survive more mistakes, right? So we were slow and learning slowly. I don't know if we would have learned as fast. Probably we would have. Um, I don't know. That's a hard... I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'd like to think so. Well, it's a risky one, though, right? Burning this, you know, again, you know, how to, you know how to do something pretty well to be able to make it to these chairs. Um, it's always there, and you can go back to it, but uh, it's a pretty bold move. Yep, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I knowing you, yeah, this is going to be good advice. Can you take the mic, please? No. <laughs> oh no! Come on. What's the product as well? Can you all remind us? Like uh, traveling in Italy is like the. Almost, uh oh this is bad. Like, I'm one of the people who said I thought it was great and didn't buy it. Okay. Sorry about that. It's all right, all right. A little musical interlude. Um, right, so, so we're Roomify, and we do booking solutions for, so the travel connection is for vacation rentals, hotels, and so on. So we left the agency side of things. Hmm. And um, the, it was this six months. We left six months ago and launched SaaS service uh, two weeks ago. Or, yeah, almost two weeks ago. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. But yeah. we, we're kind of doing the range of things. So you mm -hmm. have a SaaS service, which is $30 a month, and you get your vacation rental website. And then on the other side of things, we have what uh, Crystal was talking about, which is kind of a productized service, mm -hmm. in that as you are getting, uh, talking to bigger companies that need customizations, you have a base product, which is a distro, mm -hmm. and you customize it for them. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the choice that we made was to make all of this open source, um, so it's, it's all on, on GitHub somewhere that people can download. Customers don't actually, our customers, like the, the people that actually want to give us money, don't care about that because they don't know Drupal at all. They don't know open source at all. So it's like, can you give me what I need? And that was um, a, a really good lesson. And the other one was, it's good to go for minimum viable product, absolutely, but be very careful about the viable part of things. Mm. It's like customers will... Uh, take the competitor's page and just go through it and say, so do you have this, do you have this, do you have this? And if you don't, you need a good answer to, you know, how are they going to solve that problem? So it's, it's minimum, yes, but it, it has to be viable, and that is just as important. Um, and that's pretty much where we are right now. Awesome. Awesome. So six months. So I'm curious. So, like, if you were answering the question about, like, is it okay to, uh, to ditch the agency life? Focus it down on it. Uh, how, how are you feeling? How would you answer that? So I think my view right now mm -hmm. is that it can be, I agree with you, it can be done within an agency, but it's really, really hard. Mm. And it's probably easier because you're going to fail faster if you ditch the agency life and just do it yourself. And if you're going to do it within an agency, create a separate company yes. with a separate team and all of that. That's what we got wrong, I think. And we mm -hmm. were kind of messing around with rooms for uh, two years or something, and it was just not getting anywhere. We had nice things. We could show people landing pages and so on. 
but now it's an actual product and it's only been six months. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the marketing question, our marketing is thought leadership. I mean, look very carefully at what the, um, um, what the domain is. Any domain requires people that think about it, create content, and in our case, it's vacation rentals and hotels and so on. And there's a lot to be said about you know, how they should be building their websites and what they should be doing. And with Drupal, we have a huge advantage because while our competitors are um, focusing kind of on building everything themselves, like they, they're building a CMS, and then they're building a booking engine, and then they have to keep up with the rest of the web in terms of things happening, we just do the booking engine and we get commerce from Drupal Commerce and all the, I don't know, latest widgets that you could add to your website from all the people that immediately create a module as soon as some service pops up. Mm. So we have a huge advantage in terms of how quickly we can iterate. There's lots of problems with that as well, but it's all good. Awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Uh, a quick comment, essentially. One of the points which you mentioned about profit as last in your table, mm -hmm. I think people who are going to fund it would put right up in the top, mm -hmm. uh, right up on the top, essentially, of the table. Um, a question related to that is, um, well, you did mention the hourly rate and you know, the return of that. Is there a time period which we should look at? Um, how much should we burn before we call it quits or being successful. Yeah. So I think, um, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think the way in which you answer that, oh, uh, that was recorded, right? So uh, the way in which you have to answer that um, really goes back to those motivators. So the more boxes you can tick in that, is it learning, is it fun, are you solving your internal needs, thought leadership, the more of those that this is solving, uh, the, the larger your budget can be. Um, so if it's just profit, for example, um, it's almost like a VC model or something. But it, well, um, so again, that that's something you'll understand the market and the size of the opportunity for whatever your idea is. Um, one other thing that uh, actually I just want to reiterate that the sooner whether or not you quit the agency life or not is is a you know open question. The sooner you can put dedicated people on the the idea, the, the, that's the spot where a lot of successful people have said, like, that's, that was it. Like, that was the thing. When we got somebody who wasn't just being squeezed in around the edges, you know, every Tuesday they got to work for two hours or something, whatever it was, um, having a dedicated person was key, a critical path to success. And treating them and respecting that, not like you get to do this occasionally. Um, it's like, that is your job. I saw a couple heads nodding like there were other, did you have something? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I have a comment and a question. I'm Per Andre from uh, Frontcom in Norway. We have a couple of products. Um, so I just quickly want to mention that there's, a, there's another way to think about products as well, and that's uh, what we did with our uh, newspaper uh, distribution, which is now um, sort of like a cloud solution for a decoupled cloud solution. Uh, and then we have a newspaper clients coming to us wanting that solution, but it's not self-service or anything. There's no uh, you know, place to log in or pay or anything like that. But it's like a place you can go, you get a full-blown newspaper solution and uh, we have tons of design elements and things like that. But then um, the price is very low. They, play, uh, they pay a monthly fee. But of course, uh, they always want more. So it's like a perfect mix of uh, just off-the-shelf stuff, and uh, then you then we get all the you know the integrations and custom designs and new functionality and stuff like that. And then we share and we have a very special contract so that we uh, new features from other clients we share with new clients basically. Hmm. So it it doesn't really mean more work for us. It does mean. Um, that we have to think a bit different and plan better for when we start working with new clients or something. But now we have like 10 newspapers built off the same, uh, actually it's the same GitHub repository. Cool. Which is cool. Awesome. But I also have a question in that regard. Um, 
We have some stuff around that distribution that we would uh, like to open source. But at the same time, some of them, um, we've invested heavily in them. So we've experimented with the idea of, hmm, maybe we could you know, monetize these things somehow. <laughs> hmm. But I haven't really seen many successes in uh, trying to monetize products in uh, the Drupal um, yeah. community. In that uh, sense, except for the hosting stuff. Yeah, I Comments think. On that? Yeah, I do think that's going to be very hard. Um, unfortunately, pay, paying a subscription fee is something that um, uh, I think again, like that's an understood sort of mental model for you know the world. Uh, people are willing to pay you know like ten newspapers. That's a, that's a great model. Um, uh, I would go back to goals, like how much do you realistically think you could, you know, ma if you were, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm intuiting is like you made some modules, for example, that do some functionality, like you'd like to have that be out there, but you'd also like to charge for it. Is that kind of true? Yeah. Did I understand that right? Yeah. So, um, uh, well, GPL will, uh, you know, you're going to have intellectual property uh, concerns there. And I would... It wouldn't really work that way, though, because it would be integrated via, like, a REST API, basically. Okay. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, you might have something there. Again, like, if you charge a subscription for something like that and open it up so that others can use it and such. Um, yeah, something like a subscription for functionality is uh, doable. Something like uh, charging straight for the modules functionality. The closer you are to that, the, the less likely it is. Um, the more likely I think that you'll anger people, just, you know, you know, make people unhappy, uh, and you know, frankly, not make as much as if you'd had some other solution. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to be honest, I don't think it would work. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be awesome to hear, you know, mm -hmm. if someone had succeeded yeah. in monetizing of, you know, uh, kind of what they do in maybe in not always such a good way in the WordPress community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right, right. Do you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. To answer. That. Interesting. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Hi, uh, Taco from Gold Gorilla. Um, we were talking about WordPress plugins that are paid. Mm -hmm. So um, what we did is we took the most popular WordPress module, which is the Yoast SEO module, 22 million uh, installs, um, and we're launching it tomorrow for Drupal. Um, so <laughs> I think we'll see some more discussion about uh, it. It will be a, a free module with mm -hmm. all the features, and then we will launch a premium module which give you, gives you 24-7 support. And um, so we, we really like to have a discussion about this because we feel that um, we invested 20K in this project. We can only do this, like make a really good SEO module helping Drupal, helping all everybody here and all your clients, if we also get some money back from this. So, so what I fear sometimes for, for uh, open source is that we don't have enough money to really do innovations or really build cool products. So I'd really love to have a discussion about a premium module, which is not limiting you in, your, in features, but it will give you support. So you know if there's a bug or something, you just can call Yoast or us and we'll fix it for you. So we would like to re-experiment with paid modules in order to build better stuff for Drupal in the end. And uh, we're Gold Gorilla. If you have any feedback or discussions about this, yeah, we'd love to share these because... Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think, um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of conversations in that space, obviously, uh, and that's a tricky one. Um, I think to the extent that you are having people pay for support, that's, again, something that you, people are used to. That's a common model. Um, calling it a premium module would start, I mean, I think... Um, gets a little bit to the slippery slope of, uh-oh, I don't know. Like, it's a service that you make available to people who subscribe yeah, or something like that. So but that's, yeah, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you all. Oh. Awesome.